And so Russia is going to win this. And then they're going to have to pacify the country. And the question is, what level of internal violence and sabotage are they willing to tolerate in order to move on to the next stage of the war? As of the writing of this video, we are just over five months into Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The conflict is still going, though it appears at the moment there's a bit of a standstill. It's impressive, in a way, given that most people thought the entirety of Ukraine would be taken within just a few weeks. I honestly have no idea where the conflict is headed at this point. I guess we'll see. A useful measure as to who might have some insights into what is going to happen is looking at who made correct predictions in the past. A great place to go for accurate predictions is the podcast Deep Fat Fried, where their predictions are oftentimes so accurate that some people just can't handle it. Making a prediction about what's going to happen and then being able to, like, sell at least the narrative that your prediction came true is an important part of being a political commentator, whether we like it or not. Because being able to predict what's going to happen makes lets people know that you understand what is happening, right? Yeah. If you predict it too well, though, you're a pariah for it. Right. So you got to walk a, a walk a line, you know? There has you to be... You can't predict the real truth. Right. You've got to predict the the publicly acceptable truth. Don't go too deep with it, because you start laying out the real groundwork of shit, they're just going to be like, I'm sad now. <laughs> so don't do yeah, that. Yeah, but that makes me feel bad, and this other way makes me feel like I'm actually accomplishing something without really having to invest any time. So f you, you <laughs> tanky. You get tanky a lot. <laughs> I get tank. Well, yeah, now I get tanky because I just refuse to bow down and suck Zelensky. D I and I and I refuse to ignore the obvious role that America and its geopolitical positioning played in this war wait a minute, and Paul. continues to play. But wait it. a minute. The only pushback they ever get is from people who just don't want to hear the truth. This is the price of keeping it too real. In all seriousness, though, I'm not sure what predictions he's referring to. Usually when I hear these guys talk about what's going to happen, it's usually just some vague negative platitudes. But let's humor them for the time being. What do they think is going to happen in Ukraine? There are people out there that are trying to tell me that Ukraine is winning this war. And it's like, no, they're not. The uh, fuck, they're not. They're, they're, they can't. There's just no way that they can. Like, there's not, a, there's not enough people left in the fucking country. It's like saying, successfully, there's no winning it. It's like saying that the Iraq is going to win the war against America, you know, right. back in two, because it's like, oh man, we're, we're, we still haven't established control and stuff like, yeah, but we're going to eventually. Everyone knows that because eventually you're going to grind them down. Like taking over a country, even if you're a superpower is not an easy task. Russia, unless Russia decides, Hey, this isn't worth it. We're just going to leave. But they've com they seem like they've committed to this course of action. Eventually, they're going to f***ing prevail. They keep they keep seizing cities and sh they keep f***ing, like their their original like goal was to annex those f***ing eastern regions or whatever the Donbass, and they just keep taking cities in that area. And like that doesn't seem like winning to me. Like I don't know. So there's no way Ukraine can win. Well, they're definitely not the only ones who think this. Though most people who think that Russia's victory is inevitable have better sense than to compare the American army of Ukrainians to the American army of Afghans when the Soviet Union invaded their country. Go, look at f***ing Afghanistan. You go to a Middle Eastern look country how, and you go fucking look at arm how we a bunch of people. That country. Yeah, and go then, look like, at how we dumped a bunch of unsanctioned weapons on the quote, Russia. quote, end quote, Mujahideen to fight Russia and expel a Russian invasion and then 20 years later had to come back and pour a bunch of American lives into it. After all, who won the Soviet-Afghan war? To be fair, these guys don't just see this as the United States wasting lots of money on a lost cause. They have other concerns as well that should be taken seriously. We have seen arms go into the hands of some bad actors on the Ukrainian side. It's understandable not to want that to happen. And it's not crazy to think that the proliferation of arms will ultimately make Ukraine a more violent place, even if the Russians leave. Furthermore, a lot of people don't buy the human rights angle of the whole thing. Yes, what Russia is doing in Ukraine, especially their targeting of civilians, is terrible. But there are lots of human rights abuses, and a lot of these abuses are committed by nations the United States works with, or are friendly with, or are even our allies. There are some that are even committed by the United States, I'm sad to say. Why aren't we doing more to stop that? It's a fair point. 
My response is that we should be more vigilant in combating those, instead of being numb to them all. But the people who accuse the West of being selective here aren't wrong. A lot of critics of America's arming of Ukraine see the costs piling up from the protracted conflict. Obviously, there are enormous human costs of the war, including thousands of civilians, most of them Ukrainian. Never mind the millions of refugees. Ukraine is also an important agricultural nation. They are a major exporter of cereals and edible oil seeds, mostly to Africa, the Middle East and Asia. In a world with already stressed supply chains, the war has made Ukraine's ability to grow and export crops all the more difficult. As the Brookings Institute reports, Ukrainian current cereal stocks are estimated at about 20 to 25 million tons. The new harvest in the fall will be much lower than the last year due to less acreage and lower intensity caused by lack of necessary inputs and finance. Estimates are difficult, but market observers say it would be about 20 to 30 percent less, or about 30 million tons. The war is also going to make fertilizer harder to come by, as Russia and Belarus are major producers of potash. And given that nitrogen fertilizer is derived from natural gas, having both Russia and Ukraine in a conflict, both of which are major producers of natural gas, we will almost certainly see shortages of that as well. Surely, this is a very good reason not to want a protracted conflict. The sooner peace is made, the sooner things can go back to normal. The more America arms Ukraine, the longer it will take to achieve peace. This is only scratching the surface of the costs of the war. Given all of this, shouldn't the U.S. use its leverage to help make peace as soon as possible? We should be putting pressure on our allies to try to bring this thing to the close, rather than what we've been doing, which is putting pressure on the Ukrainians to keep this thing going. Because this is a disaster for the entire globe, and it is first and foremost a disaster for the Ukrainian people. Having a war, an endless war on their soil, is going to devastate this country for years and years to come. Yeah, that's right. Well, I don't think it's that simple. How you think this conflict should end depends on what you think the limiting principle is here. If a peace is negotiated within the near future, what's next? Would Russia be happy with the territorial gains they've made, or would they want more? The answer to that question comes down to what the conflict is ultimately about. You can also see in this map what Russia's real uh, goal is. So down below is the Crimean Peninsula. Mm-hmm which Russia annexed with little to no f***ing resistance from the international community, by the way. When was it? Back in like 2009 or 10 or something uh, like that? It was 2016 or something. Was it later? Yeah, it was, later? Okay. That was like um, 2016 or something. And you can see it kind of just hangs out there if all of the red that has been taken over by Russia is Ukraine. If it's Russia, they have a land route to that very important port and thus they've secured the, the ability to, you know, just like transfer goods in and out of the country, do more commerce. It's easier for them to do. That's what it's about. It's about money. Yeah, it's and about you know, securing a route to the sea that's unopposed by a country that you're, you're bellicose with. Uh, so the ultimate, I mean, if Russia can take this whole f***ing shebang, she will. I don't know why she's a girl. I don't, even, sudden, I, don't but, think, I don't even think I don't even think Putin I, wants it. I think I think yeah. I, mean, I think that Putin's does. I mean, I think that if she can have it, she'll take it. But I think that what she really wants is this. <laughs> she wants this big old chunk right here. Yeah, she wants a land bridge to the Crimean Peninsula, so that there's nobody that can oppose Russia's movement of military troops and goods and services in and out of that Black Sea port. That's it. That's what it's about. It's money. This explanation doesn't even make sense within its own context. Russia has had access to the Savatsevo port even after the fall of the Soviet Union, when Ukraine became its own country. The two nations negotiated a treaty wherein Russia was able to lease the port there, which also allowed them to base their Black Sea fleet there. They regularly used the port for commercial and military purposes, including bringing aid to Bashar al-Assad, their ally in Syria. The treaty was terminated by Russia just before they annexed the peninsula in 2014. Furthermore, the port has been a negative asset since Russia took it over. As Paul Goebel reported at Ukraine Weekly back in 2019, following the Russian annexation of Crimea in 2014, the Ukrainian government invoked international law and closed Savatopol and other Crimean ports to international shipping. Under the terms of this ban, any captain who docks a ship there would face massive fines and even imprisonment under international law. As a result, activity at the port of Savatopol collapsed from 4.8 million tons of cargo in 2013 
2013 to 312,670 tons in 2015, a contraction of 97% that shifted the port into the red because it can no longer pay its workers, provide money to the local government, or service its debts. In fact, Russia's belligerence has been incredibly costly to the country, given the sanctions imposed upon its economy, the costs of taking and maintaining new territory, and the great efforts, unsuccessful efforts at that, Russia has taken in order to sanction-proof its economy. On top of all that, even if you think Russia's primary motivation is money, given that Moscow's economic interests are driven primarily by natural resources, there are still some very good reasons why Russia's neighbors should be alarmed. As Agnia Grigas wrote in her book, Beyond Crimea, even though Russia has energy infrastructure intertwining its economy with its neighbors, there are still incentives for Russia to act militarily. This raises the question why Moscow would opt for potentially more costly and challenging militarized and territorial acquisitive neo-imperialism when its own energy levers have enabled it to maintain an economic imperial project in neighboring countries. The answer here probably lies in the fact that Europe and even some former Soviet states have been increasingly pursuing strategies of energy diversification. Since 2009, EU regulation has constrained Russia's gas monopoly in member states through its third energy package, which has already resulted in splitting up some of Gazprom's European assets. This was originally done under the auspices of antitrust, though they may have been considering their own energy security for exactly a time like now. All that said, there are good reasons to believe that economics is not the primary driving force behind Russia's actions. Let's look at someone who has actually made correct predictions in this area, geopolitical strategist Peter Zion. In 2014, in his book The Accidental Superpower, The Next Generation of American Preeminence, and The Coming Global Disorder, Zion predicted that Russia would invade Ukraine for demographic and geographic reasons. Russia's challenge is straightforward, if not simple. Its demographic decline is so steep, so far advanced and so multi-vectored that for demographic reasons alone, Russia is unlikely to survive as a state, and the Russians are unlikely to survive as a people over the next couple of generations. Yet within Russia's completely indefensible borders, it cannot possibly last even that long. Russia has, at most, eight years of relative strength to act. If it fails, it will have lost the capacity to man a military, to maintain a sizable missile fleet, to keep its roads and rail system in working order, to prevent its regional cities from collapsing, to monitor its frontier to delay its national twilight. The most effective use of this time would be to attempt to re-anchor in as many of Central Eurasia's border regions as possible, allowing Russia to concentrate forces in the Hordland's access points. Success would doom Russia to a slow-motion demographic disintegration from within. Failure would leave Russia open to hostile forces along all of its borders while it is disintegrating from within. The first is a recipe for death over several decades. The second is a recipe for death over one or two. It is extremely likely that Russia lacks the strength to plug all of the gaps in its frontier, so it will have to prioritize. Here is the order I see Russia acting to attempt to preserve its existence. Russia's single largest concern is Ukraine. Moscow believes that its very existence is tied to its ability to protect its vulnerable borders. And on top of that, there are plenty of natural resources to be had in Ukraine as well. Furthermore, the largest population of ethnic Russians outside of Russia live in Ukraine, primarily in the eastern portions of the country. This made it the obvious first target. The one thing Zion was wrong about was the timing. He thought the invasion would happen in 2020. It probably would have were it not for COVID-19, which brought about the economic fallout that led to oil prices crashing. Russia has typically engaged in military incursions when oil prices are high, as this gives them the most amount of leverage internationally. Zion was still correct about the eight-year time frame, though. You'll notice that Zion believes that Ukraine is Russia's first target, meaning there are likely more to come. Zion pinpoints nine gaps on Russia's periphery where their borders don't have natural protection. The last time Russia had all of these in its possession was when it was in the command of the Soviet Union. Russia now only controls one, Crimea, which they took in 2014. During the Tsarist periods of the Russian Empire and the Stalinist period of the Soviet Union, deliberate policies of Russification were taken to shore up these gaps on Russia's periphery. The most aggressive of these policies was targeted immigration of ethnic Russians by Joseph Stalin. Stalin did this with three goals in mind. As Grigas wrote, first, targeted immigration supported industrialization in the Soviet republics by enlarging the local labor force. Second, immigration and the creation of multi-ethnic societies helped establish a new identity, a Soviet nationality. 
The third goal, and the most important for the purposes of this video, was to enmesh and intertwine the 15 Soviet republics within the Union ethnically, culturally, politically, and economically. Ethnic Russians, Russian speakers, and those with close ethnic and cultural ties to Mother Russia. For example, other Slavic ethnicities or practitioners of Orthodox Christianity occupy territory in countries that exist in all of Zion's gaps. The Kremlin refers to these peoples as compatriots, claim that they are the victims of a Russian diaspora, and has anointed itself the official protector of these peoples and their interests. In reality, they mostly serve as a means to an end. The end being the reconstruction of a Russian empire secure in all of its borders, like it was during the Soviet Union. Grigas lays out a chain of policies involved in re-imperialization Russia conducts in these areas. She writes, I propose that there is a consistent trajectory in Russia's policies toward former Soviet republics and their populations, and particularly their territories where Russian compatriots reside that follow seven stages. What I term the Russian re-imperialization policy trajectory starts with 1. Soft power, and continues to 2. Humanitarian policies, 3. Compatriot policies, 4. Information warfare, 5. Passportization, 6. Protection, and finally, 7. Annexation. The formula has played itself out in Georgia, Moldova, Crimea, and now in the rest of Ukraine. The initial steps have ultimately laid the groundwork for annexation. The seeds have similarly been planted in all of the former Soviet republics, and even some of the former Warsaw Pact nations. As Grigas herself has said, though, this does not mean that annexation is inevitable. It just means that Russia has an eye towards it. So, how is any of this in America's interests? That's a fair question. Well, among the nations where initial compatriot policies have taken place are the Baltic states, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, all of which are NATO member states. If we revisit Zion's gaps, we'll see that not only does one encompass the Baltic states, another one, one of the largest ones, in fact, includes Poland, another NATO member state. In the north, we see Finland, soon to be a NATO member, and Norway, one of the original NATO members. Should Russia invade these nations, those conflicts would be incredibly costly in their own right. But remember, since they are NATO members, should they invoke Article 5, which they almost certainly would, the United States would be obligated to defend them. Russia and the United States have the first and second largest nuclear arsenals respectively. A war between those two countries would not only be incredibly costly, far costlier than anything that might happen from the war in Ukraine, it could literally be apocalyptic. So, what of Ukraine? Well, Zion, like many others, believes that Russia's victory is inevitable. The, Ru the Russians are going to still win despite all of this. They outnumber the Ukrainians, they've got better equipment, they've got shorter supply lines, they don't have to worry about controlling their borders in order to keep the resources coming. They can suck up a huge amount of casualties and Russian society will not rebel. Remember, it wasn't until you had almost a million dead in World War I that we had any inkling of political problems back in Russia. We're nowhere close to that. And a lot of Russians agree with what Putin is doing, either for nationalist regions or for strategic reasons. So this, uh, these reports that we do see about uh, people fleeing Russia, they are true. There are dissidents. They are not going to win. So far, all of the protests combined, we're still talking less than one-tenth of one percent of the population. That doesn't move the needle in a dictatorship. He said that back in April. And to my knowledge, he hasn't changed his position. While I obviously hope he's wrong, he definitely knows a lot better than I do. So the smart money would be with him being right. However, as Zion has also said, the United States has a direct interest in Russia bogging itself down in a bloody, protracted war in Ukraine. As Zion wrote at the end of 2021, when Russia began stacking troops on the Ukrainian border, perhaps the biggest change in recent years is this. The United States now has an interest in a Russian assault because it would be Russia's last war. Demographics have told us for 30 years that the United States will not only outlive Russia, but do so easily. The question has always been how to manage Russia's decline with an eye towards avoiding gross destruction. A Russian-Ukrainian war would keep the bulk of the Russian army bottled up in an occupation that would be equal parts desperate and narcissistic and protracted until such time that Russia's terminal demography transforms that army into a powerful husk. And all that would transpire on a patch of territory in which the United States has minimal strategic interest. That's rough for the Ukrainians, but from the American point of view, it is difficult to imagine a better, more thorough, and above all, safer way for Russia to commit suicide. If you think that making peace now will lead to less death and destruction in the long run, then I understand why you'd be calling for the United States cutting off Ukraine from weapons and resources. I think that the only thing at stake in this war was that little strip of land that you're talking about that f***ing leads to the Crimea. And I think that if Ukraine had just ceded that f***ing land to Putin like he wanted, like millions of f***ing people probably wouldn't have, have to die in this, whoever, who knows how long this will go on.
Yeah. Who knows how long the United States will continue to dump billions of dollars in weapons into that country and mercenaries and shit to prolong this war. Who knows? I think that the best thing for both countries, Russia and Ukraine, would have been to just fucking let him have that fucking little strip of land and then let Ukraine join NATO. Boom. Call it a day. There yeah. you go. You've got that little strip of fucking land. No, trust me. Like, do you think the people that lived in those little fucking areas that are now being blown up by bombs would rather be dead or Russian? Probably Russian. <laughs> yeah, probably so. So that's where I stand. We are engaged in a proxy war with Russia that is causing enormous damage, not only to the people there, but beyond. I believe that the evidence shows us the alternative to this proxy war is not a world as it was before Russia's invasion, but rather a larger, even more catastrophic war. Don't get me wrong, I think you should be concerned about human rights abuses, as well as more abstract things like democracy and liberalism. But I get that not everybody agrees with that. But if you want an argument as to why this is in America's self-interest, here it is. While it may seem callous towards the Ukrainians, I believe that it will lead to less suffering and misery in the long run, and ultimately a safer world. Fortunately, the Ukrainians seem willing to fight to defend their homeland rather than surrender. For this, I admire them more than I can possibly say. And as long as they are willing to fight, we should support them. Mm -hmm.